read a bit from Genesis chapter 1. Do I have enough light? I'm not going to be doing it over there. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning one day. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, you who reveal yourself to us as the creator of the heavens, the earth, and the sea, and all that is in them. We bow before you in humble adoration, worship. We believe you, we believe your word, and we pray that your spirit who inspired the scriptures will now illumine our understanding, enable us to uh, grasp what it is that you reveal to us in scripture and how we should respond to it. Bless our time together. Lord, uh, we're weary. It has already been a very trying uh, time physically and mentally. We pray that you would refresh us now and keep us alert. And we ask this for Christ's sake. Amen. 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 Well, as all of you know, there's raging controversy today, at least in our Reform and Presbyterian uh, circles with respect to creation. But I would say from talking to J.D. and others that that's true in, in uh, broader evangelical and Baptist circles as well, is it not, J.D.? So uh, churches across the spectrum uh, have been involved much more intensely in the last 15 years with this matter of creation uh, than probably be any time in the current uh, era of the church. Now, that's a bit strange because for a long time the issue lay dormant. There was not a lot of, of controversy over that. In fact, from a Reformed Presbyterian uh, perspective, I can say that there was basically a hands-off approach to creation. That most of the Reformed seminaries today, either directly or indirectly, are descendants of Princeton. And Princeton made early compromises with uh, science with respect to scripture. And even the most, uh, I mean, and, and the compromises that they made were only with day age or uh, gap theory by the, in terms of the early men, the Hodges and Warfield. But out of that came this attitude that, it was an unexamined attitude, but that the confession was not clear, the Con Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms, and that uh, Genesis 1 could legitimately be interpreted, uh, the word yom for day, as long indefinite periods of time. Now, that was, those were naive, unexamined assumptions. But because of that, all of these seminaries, conservative seminaries that grew out of the Princeton tradition passed on this concept that it really doesn't matter whether your day, age, or gap are natural six day person. It doesn't matter confessionally, it doesn't matter exegetically. And so you have generations, we're talking about the uh, almost the entire 20th century, generations of even conservative uh, reformed theologians and preachers who naively sat there. My own mentor and the founder of this seminary would tell you that he sat there and taught that one of the things that's very admirable about that man is that he has publicly repented of that, uh, of that attitude. But that's 
One of the reasons that there was no controversy, that there was simply a live and let live uh, attitude. Now, in both the PCA and OPC reports, I think probably the OPC report just copies the PCA report at that point. They get into why is this now a controversy? And they offer ecclesiastical cultural region, reasons, uh, homeschooling, curriculum, uh, theonomy, a lot of things like that. And probably to some degree those other factors play in. But I, in my own experience, the, the first thing that came to play for me was I finished seminary in 1971, believing that as long as you, you know, were day age or whatever, you weren't theistic evolutionists, but you know, that this chapter one wasn't clear. And I made the mistake in my first church of deciding I would preach the book of Genesis. And I hadn't, literally had not gotten halfway through chapter one of Genesis when I realized that uh, I was completely wrong. There was no other way to understand Genesis one than normal, natural days as we would understand them today in, in sequence. And that was a major change in my own thinking. Uh, and it made me um, a, a consistent creationist. But then something else has happened, and I think this is in the OP report, Dan and I were talking about this last night, is that about 20 years ago, these two, well, in terms of popularity, framework hypotheses began to circulate in kind of a vague way. Uh, to the teaching of Meredith Klein. And as its popularity grew in reform circles, that then caused the bells to go off, the, the, the siren, the alarm for people like me. I was teaching with Dr. Klein, and when I was dealing with also a number of students and interns that were really wrestling now with, with this, and then when another member of the faculty who had been a six-day creationist, an Old Testament man, flipped on the issue, I, think, I came to the compulsion that I had to start writing on this, that this was, was not just something that uh, was going to uh, be a backwater uh, view. And so I began to engage at the critique of these more modern views of framework and then in our conference um, back in 1999, the analogical. As we'll see, there are huge differences between six-day creation, our, our, our day-age creation, and these other two views of framework and uh, analogical. And it really does change the whole environment, I think, of the discussion and of the uh, very uh, nature and integrity of scripture and approach to it. And so because of that, Greenville Seminary as well has become, uh, I hope not strident and arrogant, but uh, clearly outspoken uh, on the issue. Our first conference, and that's their textbook, then came from that conference to God create in six days published a faculty statement uh, on creation. Uh, this is clearly in uh, historic Reformed Christianity and the Confession of Faith, believing in six normal days of creation. Now what I want to do is show you uh, why. Now, it, it's been a bit backwards. Normally we would do the exegetical work first and then bring in the science, but because of schedules, it, it works out this way. So we simply are, it's like these movies, you know, now you get the flashback, the beginning. Um, and so uh, why we have come to where we are. Now a little bit of historical background. Um, contra what you read in a number of the apologists for a non-literal view, but although there was some uh, minority opinion in the history of the church, about uh, an immediate creation, 
not long ages of creation, but uh, uh, immediate creation. Uh, through the history of the church, probably even up to uh, Dean John Collett and uh, some others who were even alive, not in the Puritan movement, but in the Anglican Church in the age of the Westminster Assembly, there was this minority opinion that God did everything in a second. Genesis 6 then describes for us so we can understand it uh, in that sequential uh, fashion. But even then, that what God did in a second, he did it in an orderly manner. He did it 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. But the primary position through the history of the church was a literal sequential six days. Although someone like Hugh Ross and others will say that there was no anti-Nicene, now anti-A-N-T-E means before, that when you think about the church fathers, you have the Nicene fathers, those that were wrote uh, around and after the time of the Nicene Council and the Christological controversy. So the early church fathers were called the anti-Nicene fathers. They were the closest to the apostles. And some men actually make the claim that all anti-Nicene fathers, not one of them was a six-day creationist. Well, that just isn't true. Uh, Barnabas, in the uh, first chapter, 146, Irenaeus, I think that uh, Jonathan dealt with Irenaeus, Theophilus, Victorinus, Methodius, all of those men, as well as uh, uh, Basil and Gregory of Nisa, uh, Ambrose, who would then come later, uh, all of those men were six day creationists. Some of them wrote books called Hexameron, Six Days, uh, and that was a very consistent witness from the beginning. It was the position of the reformers. You heard it was the position of Luther, it was the position of Calvin, it was the position of the second and third generation reformers, it was the position of the uh, framers of the Heidelberg Catechism and Belgic Confession, and it was the position of the framers of the Westminster uh, Confession and Catechisms. Within Reformed Presbyterian circles, as best as this can be shown, and in your textbook you've got Dr. Smith's survey of the history of it within Presbyterianism, and you've got David Hall's two very good chapters with respect to history. Uh, there is no evidence of any Reformed or Presbyterian theologian from the Reformation until uh, about 1830 holding to any other position. Now, history doesn't make things right, but we've got to set the record straight that uh, this has been the, the position of the church. Now, what happened in 1830? Well, uh, the Princeton men began to respond to uh, the claims of uniformitarianism and an old earth, a very, very old earth, although not nearly as old as people today want to say that it was. And so they, uh, again, a lot of naivete goes through this. They naively accepted, this must be right, because the scientists are saying it. You know, perhaps you used to approach your doctor that way and you eventually learned that you know they're, they're not infallible either. This must be right, a scientist has said it. Um, and so, in order to preserve, they love the Word of God. In order to preserve the Word of God, they began scrambling around looking for um, an exegetical position that would make the Bible compatible with uniformitarianism, with old earth uniformitarian geology. They weren't trying to be compatible with evolution, although McCosh, the president who came from Scotland of Princeton College, and for a very brief period of time, and I, I told Jonathan that he was mistaken on this, you'll hear that Warfield was theistic evolutionist, and Warfield will say that it's that in the immaturity of his university days he was, uh, he's, he calls it sophomore, uh, that's probably a paraphrase, but that's what he's saying. He became basically day age. It's a big difference between day age and theistic Evolution. So these men were not committed to theistic evolution. They really were not trying to reconcile uh, with um, subsequent uh, to, to Darwin, uh, at least the Princeton Seminary men, but they were trying to reconcile 
uh, with uh, the claim to geology, which we talked the other day. It was very interesting that in, in Cambridge, at Boston and Cambridge, the, um, the Unitarian Louis Agassiz was opposed to uniformitarian geology, and the evangelical Gray was committed to it. Uh, and so even then, it wasn't a completely a theological um, issue, but there were uh, scientific problems as well that people like Agassiz uh, recognized. But out of that, then, is, is how we get this development. So when you read, as in, I think, in Mr. Harris's piece, that there's no really concern to accommodate the Bible to science. Well, my question is, why did the church not come up with this interpretation before the scientists started claiming that the earth was very old and ancient? That it, surely, in 2,000 years of New Testament ex Jesus, somebody would have begun to question the uh, natural interpretation of Genesis chapter 1 before there was a... Um, a claim of, of science uh, about the age of the earth. So that's that's what happened. Hodge admits, volume one of his three volumes, according to the generally received interpretation of the first chapter of Genesis, the process of creation was completed in six days. He himself would attack Darwinianism, but at first he advocated the gap theory, we'll come back to that, and then uh, day age since it was more consistent with the geological record. And then early in the last century in Holland, the concept of the framework hypothesis or theory uh, was developed, as I said, popularized then uh, in the second half of the 20th century by uh, Dr. Meredith Klein, picked up now by other uh, evangelical Old Testament people like Salheimer and for a while Walkie and others. 1955, uh, Bernard Ram, in the Christian view of science, sets forth the pictorial view. And I find the pictorial view to be kind of very, to be very similar to Jack Collins' analogical view. We'll talk about uh, those uh, later in more detail. So today now, and when I first worked on this lecture, I, I put down theistic evolution not acceptable in Reformed circles. <laughs> uh, that has changed radically in the last five years. Uh, and so with men like Dr. Walkie now advocating theistic evolution uh, and the uh, aggressive nature of, of biologos in pushing that position, even to the degree of, of denying a historical uh, Adam and Eve, we uh, once again in the church now are going to be wrestling with this issue. Which you need to understand that it, this issue starts over here with people that have uh, weaker views of scripture. About two or three years ago, Anderson Genesis asked me to do an online review of a book that was written by uh, a husband and wife team they taught at Calvin College. And it view was reform perspectives on origins or something like that. Oh, I was kind of excited. Uh, actually, what the book is is a veiled, thinly veiled apologetic for theistic evolution. They put everything into the camp of uh, allowable. Um, and that started probably 10 years ago, and, and now it's just it's growing like a, a snowball. So once again, even for those of us that are in more conservative denominations, uh, we're going to, we are being faced uh, with this. Probably out of all of the non-literal views, the one that would be most palatable is the gap theory. It's, it's, it, does, it does no real harm to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, the gap theory uh, posits that uh, Genesis 1, 1, and 2 describe the initial creation and then something catastrophic happened, perhaps the fall of the angels, and uh, 
So what we have then is this chaos uh, that was existent. And so then that could have been some long period of time that the earth in a ragged form was here. And then uh, Genesis 1 uh, is a literal account of God's reforming of uh, the creation structure that was uh, so radically affected by the fall of angels. So it's the least objectionable, both exegetically, although we'll see that there are some problems with the approach to verses 1 and 2, Fred. With that view, do they see animal populations, everything before the degeneration in the gap? Yeah, I think they would explain uh, animal death and everything else by, by the fact that there was a creation that was then radically destroyed by the, by the fall. So, um, and interestingly, that was the position of Thomas Chalmers, the great hero of the Scottish disruption in the 1840s, and of this early Schofield Bible, and I think continues to be the position of some people at Bob Jones. Would that be correct, J.D.? There's still some there that would teach the, uh, the gap. You don't think so? It, it really has died out. I think it has died out for the most part because it exegetically doesn't really work with Genesis 1, 2, relationship of 1, 1 to 1, 2, and then 1, 2, 2, 2, 1, 3. So it really falls on exegetical grounds. So the day age position became the popular position. And it was the popular position. I mean, you think about the, the, the fundamentalists who talked about you know, Brian. <laughs> Bryant was a day age. I don't know. All the fundamentalists, none of them, they hated the evolution. But they were just like the Princeton men. They had to protect the Bible. And so the great majority of fundamentalists were day age. They, they weren't fundamentalists on uh, Genesis chapter 1. Uh, but the day age uh, concept, as it was initially taught, was that uh, God would have created things and then there would have been gaps of time between day one and day two. Now the strengths of that is that they held to the uh, uh, sequence and to fiat creation, which is why you can see that people were not as alarmed. The only real tension it had with the text would be in terms of the length of the day, and that's where they uh, were pro producing and buying into, I believe, uh, not deliberate, but faulty exegesis. One of the advantages that we have is programs like Logos and Bible Works. They, they weren't able to access quickly every use of Yom in the Old Testament. But I did that in 30 minutes with Logos when I first started working on this. Able then to investigate their claims that we'll come to about that uh, particular Hebrew word. So they were even trying to be exegetically faithful. They weren't playing uh, any, any games uh, with, with the text. And that's why, and we're going to come back to this when we get into the, um, tomorrow, the idea of the uh, animus in poentis. Um, the radical nature between day age and the two kind of poetical analogical. Of course, the problem with day age as well is it no longer fits the geological record either. And so now you have somebody like Hugh Ross that's taken day age and adapted that to uh, day age progressive creation. And uh, although he holds to the normal, some of the normal sequence, he also will have, I think, overlaps and, and such. Because the sequence of Genesis 1 does not work either. So once you try to start accommodating, you're going to uh, have these difficulties. And then we've got framework, uh, and that is the view that Genesis 1 is not to be taken as a, a literal chronological account of creation, but rather a topical account, which asserts that God created all things. Just this quotation from the Geneva Study Bible. Finally, some scholars argue that the days of creation constitute a literary framework 
designed to teach that God alone is the creator of an orderly universe and to call upon human beings made in the image of the creator God to reflect God's creative activity in their own pattern of labor. This framework hypothesis views the days of creation as God's gracious accommodation to the limitations of human knowledge, an expression of the infinite creator's work in terms understandable to finite and frail human beings. This last group of scholars observes that the universe gives the appearance of great antiquity, that the phrase morning and evening seems inconsistent with the day-age theory, and that the notion of intervening ages between isolated 24-hour days is not apparent from the text. So you see, again, they are interacting with one scientific claim, the apparent age of the Earth, and then exegetically they have trouble with day-age and even Hugh Ross. So, that is in the uh, Geneva Study Bible, uh, page 7. Unfortunately, in the same section there, the author uh, caricatures the uh, literal six-day view of Genesis chapter 1. So, and then the newest view on the street is the uh, analogical. I lump it with the pictorial as well. And this position has been, um, whether Collins consciously was working off of RAM or not, I don't know, but Jack Collins, who teaches at Covenant Seminary, is the father of the analogical view. It says the days are God's work days, and they're analogous and not necessarily identical to uh, our uh, week. The six days represent periods of God's historical supernatural activity in preparing and populating the earth as a place of humans to live, love, work, and worship. The days are broadly successive, successive periods of unspecified length. They may overlap or be topical, logical, rather than chronological, for the grouping of some events in a particular day. Earlier, Ram wrote, creation was revealed in six days, not performed in six days. And that's what Collins would say. He would say it's revealed in six days. And that way he seeks to avoid the, what he will admit, the exegetical problem of the framework. Uh, but that God didn't necessarily do it in that manner. And we're going to come back to those. Although, uh, you've already seen, just in, in a very sketchy way, that the um, authoritative claims both of geologists and uh, scientists with respect to the age of the Earth and evolution are quite flawed. And uh, our approach to, we don't have any scientific uh, facts like gravity or, uh, that are pushing us back to, to re-examine Genesis chapter 1. Uh, and so what I want you to do is to reverse your way of thinking. I want you to start with Scripture and then to move forward from there. So I've got some... Uh, first, why is this important? I've been asked the question. I was called the troubler of Israel. Even though I'm in the PCA, I was accused of a lot of problems that were happening in the OPC out on the, on the West Coast. And my response was, you're the men that were teaching this. I wasn't, I'm not teaching. I just, I didn't name you. Uh, I did people I named. Well, of course, everybody knew what Mary Klein believed. The other person I interacted with was actually in the PCA. But it really wasn't an issue in the PCA then. Uh, it was primarily in the um, 80s an issue in the OPC. I mean, in the 90s. But why is it important? Because I'm often asked the question, why make a big deal out of this? And basically, the two creation reports, as you know, it's what they really come down to, you know. We just need to live and let live. We've got these four views in the church now. Let's, uh, let's go on with the important business of the gospel. Well, let me give you some reasons of why I think it is very important. First, uh, for those of us that are in... Uh, Confessional church is confessional integrity. No Reformed confessions teach anything other than six normal days. Now, I recognize that some of them do not address the question with any specificity. Well, you read the writers of those documents, and they did. But uh, 
there is no confessional grounds for any other position. There already said no reformed theologian before the 1830s taught otherwise. And all the historical evidence points to the language of the Westminster Confession of Faith meaning six normal days. And there I commend to you the work of David Hall in the, I think it's chapter two uh, in the textbook. You're going to see some very interesting claims when we talk about the, the PCA and OPC reports about the Westminster Confession of certain names thrown around. And there's not one of those um, that is accurate in its context. There is, well, you can read David's article. To Scripture's premium on the supernatural and sovereign character of God's creating work. One of the things that we're going to do this morning is we are going to um, look in the second section and what the rest of the Bible says about Genesis chapter 1. So much of the discussion has focused on arguing over genre and uh, this chapter. Uh, I think you will be amazed at how the rest of the Bible treats Genesis chapter 1 and the preponderance of testimony from the rest of Scripture. It becomes a scriptural apologetic then. God alone is God. Isaiah 45, 18, Revelation 10, 6. God alone is to be feared and worshipped. Revelation 4, 11, 14, 7, Acts 14, 15. God keeps his word, his decreed word, his promises in scripture. Psalm 33, 6 through 11. Isaiah 40, 21, 22, and 26. The very nature of the new birth is described by Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 as creation. Uh, but in 2 Corinthians 4, Paul takes the creation of light on day one to be the very paradigm or pattern for the generation. I add as well, God proves his power, his omnipotence, uh, by the fact that he is uh, created. Just this morning I read in uh, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 19, and it just reminded me, this is a phrase that you find throughout the Old Testament. But God told Jeremiah to go by this land Jeremiah's prophesying 70 years of captivity. And so Jeremiah uh, prays, verse 17, 32, 17, Ah, oh, Lord God, behold, here's how he prefaces his prayer. Thou hast made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and by thine outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for thee. You see how he comforts himself with the omnipotence of God? Creation. And so it becomes throughout the Bible a proof, a, an apologetic, a grounds for uh, God's power. So there's just eight, I mean five reasons of uh, apologetic reasons that Scripture uses creation. A third reason of the importance is that this chapter and its interpretation relates to many other key doctrines in the Bible. Uh, one man I say, head of the human race created by God. The imputation of sin. Christ the covenant head. Covenant history. The historical nature, Genesis 1 uh, through 11. The flood. The integrity of Scripture and the integrity of the interpretation of Scripture. It's... I... People don't like to hear the domino theory, but it's not always wrong. It is quite true in many instances. Um, and I, as I've written on this, I've pointed out that there are no exegetical breaks. This whole approach to Genesis 1, poetic framework and whatever, by not building on the foundation of historical grammatical exegesis, paying attention to the grammar, uh, the context, the place of the book and the history of scripture, um, destroys exegesis. And there's no breaks. Now that statement is unfortunately being validated day after day. 
So now we have framework people who are theistic evolutionists. So they, they began. And increasingly, I've watched framework people become um, local flood people. And not just local flood people, but that not even all flesh was destroyed uh, in the flood. And then they began to play other games uh, with scripture. I think Davis Young is a good example of a geologist who just has continued on a, uh, a downward spiral. And so the whole approach particularly these last two views of framework and analogical is fraught with exegetical difficulties and I think destructive uh, consequences. Which leads to a fourth thing and that is it does great damage to the plain meaning of scripture. Westminster Confession of Faith talks about the doctrine of perspicuity, the clarity of scripture, the cl plain this, the clarity of Scripture. Now it says that not all things alike are clear. Everything that's necessary for salvation, though, and for knowing God, are clear. And you will have these framework and logical people talk about, well, we know that you know, this is difficult. But it's never been difficult in the history of creation. If you cannot read Genesis 1 and understand it, you can't read the rest of the Bible and understand it. But it really takes, I mean, I've heard Ruben Elders and Presbytery challenge ministers. Why is it that only ministers believe this? Or if you have been in a Presbytery and tried to hear a young seminary graduate explain framework or analogical view, if it wasn't so tragic, it'd be laughable. It is a true mystery religion. It is esoteric because it's not built on common sense, uh, biblical exegesis. And so the average person cannot sit down and read Genesis 1 and really know what God's talking about. In fact, now I've not verified this, but it's uh, some of you know that... Uh, that Peter Inns is actually writing homeschool curriculum on how to interpret the Bible. This is a man that, that denies the traditional biblical view of, of inspiration and errancy. And uh, Jonathan said that he actually says you ought not to teach creation, Genesis. Your children don't read these first chapters of Genesis because it's way beyond them. I remember uh, when I was teaching Christian education at another seminary, and I, one of the assignments that I had given to the, the men was divided into small groups to prepare a lesson plan. I deliberately assigned a um, catechism question on creation. And the student who was framework got up and was making the presentation. And uh, he was saying, look, this and this and this. And I just looked at him in all sincerity. I said, you can't do that. Why not? Because you don't believe it. And he would have thought I'd hit him. And this time he was very angry. But you can't teach framework to children. And so the Bible becomes a very foundational doctrine. As we're going to see, I've already said, God makes this is the doctrine by which he distinguishes himself from all idols. Uh, and yet people cannot understand it. I taught a couple of classes one time at the church here in town, and their first assignment was, I want you to go home this week and read Genesis chapter 1 and come back and tell me what you think it means. And so the whole doctrine of perspicuity is challenged by this. And frankly, I don't know another orthodox doctrine in Scripture this is clear. The Trinity isn't as clear revealed in Scripture. The Incarnation is not as stated as often I don't know any orthodox doctrine stated this often in Scripture, as I think I'll be able to show you in the second hour. Our approach should be that we should take the literal sense of the text, unless such is clearly figurative or contradicts the context or clear teaching of Scripture. When I taught that position at a Reformed seminary, I was accused, and to this day I'm accused, of... Um, fundamentalistic dispensational hermeneutic. But listen to Mr. Turretin. 
We must not rashly and unnecessarily depart from the proper literal sense unless it really clashes with the articles of faith and the precepts of love and the passage uh, on this account from other parallel passages is clearly seen to be figurative. Same thing that I was saying. It is the classic rule of double interpretation. You'll find it in, in Burkhoff and all of the any decent book uh, on the science of interpreting the Bible. Collins changes the position to that what's clear is the principle of the clear intention of the author. That is what we're looking for in the text. Not the, the default position is not what the text is literally saying unless seen otherwise. The default thing is what is the intent of the author. But how do you find the intent of the author except from the text? If the text isn't clear, you're not going to know the intent of the author. If it is clear, then he's, he's manifested his intent by that which he has written. Ritter Boss, who was not a friend of six day creation, wrote, one in reached Genesis 1 without prepossession or suspicion is almost bound to receive the impression that the author's intent is to say the creation took place in six ordinary days. But we cannot stop here. He's bound also to receive the impression that the earth was created first and afterwards the sun, moon, stars, etc. So he's saying this clear meaning contradicts the uh, theories of science, so obviously, even though it is the clear meaning of, of the scripture. Noel Weeks, another Australian, asked the question, in absence of any biblical evidence to the contrary and the presence of frequent references to the narrative, this is the rest of the scripture, as historical narrative, the obvious way to read Genesis 1 is the obvious way. It's impossible for God to use a misleading form of description. If Genesis 1 was not meant to be taken of little account, why was it written that way? E.J. Young, if Moses had intended to teach a non-chronological view of the days, it is indeed strange that he went out of his way, as it were, to emphasize chronology and sequence. Now, as we move into an uh, examination of Genesis chapter 1, these are the assumptions uh, by which I'm operating. First is, the God who reveals himself in the Bible is the true God who created all things. And it's already been pointed out by Dr. Sarford, the atheists are living on borrowed capital. They really cannot think or do science without a personal, nobody can think and do science without a personal creator God who made that pulls all things. Two. The 66 books of the Bible are the inspired, infallible Word of God, our only rule of faith and practice. Three, origins are beyond the scope of science. I think that this was also dealt with earlier in the week. We can only get theories that are an attempt to explain what we observe. Four, and very important, faith as a means of knowledge is not inferior to empirical investigation. Faith as a means of knowledge is not inferior to empirical investigation. There are three ways that anybody knows something. Observation. Huh. Have you observed this week the sun is hot? Can't look at it? Testimony. How many of you have been to the southern hemisphere? Okay, so the rest of you haven't. The three of us have, so we tell you that there are different constellations in the southern hemisphere. Uh, can you have true knowledge then of those constellations because we bear testimony to you of that? Yes, if we are reliable, trustworthy people. So you read history, you read uh, various accounts, and so testimony from reliable sources. And then third is inferences, conclusions based on the former two, on observation and testimony. These are the three, only three ways I can think of that we come to, to, uh, to know something. Now, as part of this, all of us, as we've again already talked about, bring religious presuppositions to discussion of anything. The naturalist has three basic presuppositions. One, all things are material. Two, uh, knowledge by scientific is by scientific method. And three, history is based on uniformitarianism. Contrast, the Reformed Christian says, 
The creator creature distinction explains all reality. Scripture is foundational to all knowledge. History is possible because of providence from which we may learn and apply lessons. So then, faith is a valid means of knowledge. Faith is merely the acceptance of testimony. The source is reliable and qualified. There's no reason not to accept. Who could be a more reliable witness to what he did in creation than God himself? So if you believe that the Bible is a reliable testimony of the reliable witness, then you are bound to accept his testimony, even if it puts you in a place of difficulty with certain claims uh, of, uh, of science. Sure. How are you using the scientific method here? A lot of evolution is not based on scientific method. I just said the presupposition, they claim it is. I just said, there is presupposition, everything's material, the knowledge only comes from the scientific method. Now they're violating that, but that's, that's where they're beginning. They claim that this is the scientific method. We know it's not. Um, is that a faith-based statement? Huh? Isn't that a faith? A faith well, that's what I'm saying. That everybody brings religious presuppositions. So, fifth, I said the God in the Bible is a reliable witness, and it's the intention of Genesis 1 to teach us that God directly and instantaneously created all things, how and in what order. It is the intention of Genesis 1 to teach us that God directly and instantaneously created all things how and in what order. And I use the word intention intentionally. I believe the text is quite clear to us that it was Moses' intent, as he wrote this by inspiration, to communicate this to us. And then sixthly, we approach this issue, science must operate within the walls and on the foundation of revelation. We here now get the whole discussion of general revelation and special revelation. General revelation is that which is God reveals himself to all men, what's in the heart, the conscience, what is seen in the creation, the unfolding of providence, all these things. Special revelation, 66 books of the Bible. Both are revelatory. God is speaking very clearly in the photosynthesis of those trees, in the rising of the sun this morning. But just as people misinterpret special revelation, today they were making the confusion between the revelation and its interpretation with respect to general revelation. The claims of scientists and others about general revelation are not general revelation. They are the interpretation. And then we have a problem because Paul tells us in Romans chapter 1 that the natural man suppresses what God is revealing. Again, I'm quite shocked when I interact with my Reformed brothers and that they're, they seem to ignore this fact that the natural man cannot be expected to make honest statements about the revelation of God. He's going to, he's going to create a, a, a pseudoscience to cover up, as we've seen. I mean, uh, it's appalling at times that what links they go to. For example, the, you quoted the guy, the Genesis, who said that there was no information code. You know, just, the guy knows better. But they're going to do anything to suppress the truth. And so the, the natural man is not neutral when it comes to the examination of the revelation of God. He is going to invent systems that suppress that revelation. And the presuppositions of the atheist are godless. There's a very good book by David Boltenheiser. I think we have the library. If not, I'll be glad to lend my copy of it. He was a, um, an evolutionist. He was converted. And he, he gets in, not into the science, but the presuppositions. What makes these people tick? Why are they doing, quote, science, and quote, the way that they're doing it? And so, and then the second thing, and as Calvin says, that the scriptures are the spectacles by which we then read general revelation. 
The, the natural man suppresses it. The converted man must have corrective lenses. And so scripture trumps general revelation. And I believe that we're bound to approach scripture in that way. Now, what this means is what we've been doing this week, that uh, I'm very thankful for the movement of, of the Christian faith and examination on the part of Christians who are scientists. But they'll be the first to tell you that they are offering, uh, they, can, they can observe things in the laboratory, such as the complex structure of cells and things like that. Um, but there'll be many things that they're going to tell you just honestly, just as they, uh, a secular should tell you as well. I am offering a theory. This is a plausible explanation. The difference is the Christian who's doing science is building the foundation of Scripture. And what he's trying to show us is that there are theories that are every bit as uh, clear and logical and plausible to explain what is observed uh, as the theories of a secular scientist, and they're based upon scripture. But the, they, we're still getting theories, and you'll get differences of opinion uh, in terms of uh, uh, light speed and stuff like that. But all they're saying is, is that there are ways to look at the evidence and interpret it in a way that's consistent with Scripture. And that's all a scientist can do with respect to origins. Katie? This question, you just said that um, Scripture trumps natural revelation. Is that slightly different than, uh, different from what many of the theologians in the 19th century like to say, which is that uh, God speaks through both scripture and revelation, uh, natural revelation, and they are equal. Yeah, if they say they're equal, God speaks equally. But God's speaking, just as we say the Bible cannot be understood in a saving way by the unregenerate. And even the regenerate must have God's illumination rightly to understand it. So it's one thing to say that God speaks in the Bible. Uh, is God speaking through all of Piper's interpretations of the Bible? Well, I, I pray and, and labor under that end, but I'm not infallible. Uh, and so, but there's a greater degree of fallibility when you, when you begin to interpret uh, the natural revelation. So that's why it trumps it in terms of uh, they're not equal. And again, today there's a whole wrath of Reformed uh, theologians that talk about the equality of the two. Well, it's equal that God is speaking out there uh, in those trees and in the sun and and uh, God spoke in the headlines of the paper today, not the words, but the if they record facts that took place, these are things that God and His providence did. And we have a responsibility to try to understand providence as well, but our interpretations of providence must always be uh, tenuous, particularly when close to the fact. Uh, and so that's the thing, is that uh, it's the interpretation, and that's why we have the scripture. So anything that's in the general realm that scripture um, interprets for us, that's where scripture trumps the interpretation. It doesn't trump the revelation, it trumps the interpretation of the revelation. Yeah, when I went and listened to Hugh Ross give a talk on this, he's known for saying that nature is the 67th book of yeah. the Bible. And I, I called him on that, respectfully called him on that. And I said, that, that's impossible because you don't have grammar and syntax in, re, in natural revelation. He said, that's really equivocation on your part. You're equivocating the two terms of revelation. And no system, systematician is going to do that in systematic theologies. He's going to carefully delineate. So many uh, it really wasn't a very good response. I got, he was, you know, he's a... He understands what I was trying to say. Yeah. yeah. It is a vindication. So. And it does exalt uh, that. It's very interesting, for example, take Psalm 19. The first half, God's glory is manifested. 
but the transformative revelation of God is special revelation. And in Romans 1, it leaves without excuse. Uh, but it's suppressed. And these are things that we have to realize. Well, now, the fun part. Let's get into uh, Genesis chapter uh, 1. And we'll start with uh, the first uh, two verses. Uh, some people take these verses as acts of day one. I mean, some literal creation uh, interpreters. And others see them as a kind of preliminary or summary statement. Um, but I think that as we look at it in, the, um, in its context, I think we, I take it as part of, of day one. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was uh, a waste, a void, and uh, desolate, uninhabitable, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered upon the face of the waters. Now, the first uh, translation difficulty we have here is that grammatically, there's two ways to read Genesis chapter 1. You could grammatically, correctly read it. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was. And that uh, translation would say that there was this stuff and God began to work on it. Now, the second grammatically acceptable interpretation is what we have in most of our better English Bibles, in the beginning God created. The grammatical problem, just to touch on it briefly, um, is in Hebrew there's two forms of nouns. There's construct nouns and absolute nouns. And uh, the first telltale for construct is it lacks the definite article, so it's called anarthus. And normally an anarthus noun is in construct. And so if you have an anarthus noun with a finite verb, which is what we have in the beginning, beginning doesn't have definite article, uh, created uh, is the verb, the finite verb immediately after that. And then the, the, uh, the subject God is after the word create. And so you could grammatically translate this um, in the beginning when God created it. But we have uh, a number of instances where uh, anarthus nouns are not used in construct with a finite verb. In fact, we have two instances where this word beginning is uh, without the definite article and yet is not construct. And that is in Isaiah 46.10 and Deuteronomy 33.21. So that grammatically we're not forced into the construct position. So we then must have other um, evidences help us interpret uh, which way to write this. Bob Raymond in the Systematic gives E.J. Young's reasons. The first is, uh, in the Hebrew text, verse sheath is accented, that's the word beginning, with a disjunctive accent. So on the last uh, syllable, and disjunctive accents um, indicate that a word has its own independent accent. It doesn't need the accent of the word it's in construct with. And so that pushes to the fact that Barashith is to be taken here, and that is how it was understood by the Jews in the Masoretic text. Without exception, all the ancient versions regarded Barashith as absolute. In the beginning, God created and then in the Old Testament, when a construct noun precedes a finite verb, the fact of the constructness, in other words, the verb is part of the noun, the grammatical construction, is apparent either from the form of the noun and construct or from the demands of the context that the noun be so taken. In this case, neither function is the case. In fact, the verb bara, although frequently employed with the product produced, is never employed with material. Never. 
So to say in the beginning when God created, and then you've got this material mentioned in verse 2, bara never is used with material, only the product. And so the context and uh, the use of bara in that then point to the traditional rest of scripture points to that. Uh, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was God. Hebrews 11.3, uh, God alone is eternal. And of course there is the theological, philosophical impossibility of eternal matter. And so for all of those reasons, uh, the uh, traditional reading as you have in your Bibles, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what we have here then is the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, E-X-N-I-H-I-L-O, which means out of nothing. The doctrine does not say that every act of creation within the six days was out of nothing, but it teaches that God made by his own creative power all the stuff from which he would make everything else. So that first created act, God brought into existence that which is described in verse 2. And I use the analogy that you've got the architect, the Lord God decreed, and then what does a builder do? He gathers his building materials. That's what we have now in verse 1 and 2. And then he begins to put it together, and that's what we have in verses 3 to 31. So, the doctrine of ex nihilo creation does not mean that everything in the creation specifically was made out of nothing. Man was made of the dust of the ground. But that the original mass from which God would create everything was made out of nothing by the power of his word. Larry? Uh, Dr. Pineville, do you see any space or any wiggle room here for the contemporary cosmology of Big Bang being read into this uh, opening uh, phrase that uh, creation began, when, including time and everything at that moment, would you would you see that as a possible? I don't think so. I don't, and if we work our way through this exegetically, I, th I think you'll see why I don't. Okay, so you don't. Is that what you I said? Don't, right. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. By his word, and part of that is, is, is we'll talk a lot about the word, the, Greek, the Hebrew word bara is used here in 1 1. As I'll show you later, that word, when God is a subject, is always a supernatural um, act from God's part. Almost always an immediate, instantaneous, supernatural act on God's part. We also see the uh, intimations of the Trinity involved in creation. Uh, Elohim uh, is in itself a plural form that doesn't demand the Trinity, but lays a foundation for the concept of plurality within the Godhead. But in verse 2, we have now the Spirit of God. And you will have those who maintain that the Holy Spirit is not revealed until the New Testament. In fact, I think J.I. Packer does that in Knowing God. That's not true. Every use of Spirit of God in the Old Testament is a reference to the third person of God. And then we have, of course, God speaking, and we'll come back to that in a moment, but uh, the New Testament is quite clear that is God the Son. So creation is a Trinitarian act by the eternal God who made all things out of nothing. All that's packed into verse 1. So by his word, he brought into existence the heavens and the earth. The first created this, on this, if you take, uh, you can take Genesis 1-1 to refer to the immediate sphere of uh, the, cre the created material sphere of the universe and earth. I take it uh, here to refer to everything that God created. God also created heaven, uh, his dwelling place. And in the Hebrew, you have heavens, heavens, the third heavens. Third heaven, or heaven of heavens, refers to uh, the throne room of God, a created place where God manifests himself personally uh, to uh, angels and to uh, saints. And I think that this was the first thing he made when it says he made the heavens and the earth. He made the highest heavens, 
Hebrew 9, 6. Uh, excuse me, Nehemiah 9, 6 and Hebrews 11, 10. And I believe it includes angels. And although Moses, at hearing rather than the description of sensible and visible things, does not expressly mention their creation, still he sufficiently intimates it by the phrase, the host of heaven in Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And by the fact the Bible teaches us that heaven is their habitation. Jude 6, Luke 2.13, Matthew 24.36, that's turret. And then we find that delightful expression in Job 38, 6 and 7, that angels applauded God at creation. So when he founded the earth on day one, they were reckoned as the first amongst his creatures, and they immediately began their work of praising God as he brought one thing after another into uh, existence. So Turretin takes this as part of day one. He says, till it seems more satisfactory and more suitable to the Mosaic narration that this first verse described the beginning of creation by the production of the two general parts of the world. Afterwards, it's followed by a description of the particulars contained in the heavens and the earth, and that is plainly gathered. Bavink and Raymond take it as a more general statement. Bavink, some time lapsed before, perhaps. Raymond, a summary statement of what we're reading in Genesis um, chapter 1. Bavink bases this on the absence of light and alteration of night and morning on day one, but he fails to note this formula ends the day and does not begin it. That's the significance of the phrase, as we shall see. So I take verse 1 the traditional way. In the beginning, God, Father, Son, and Spirit created all things, uh, all temporal material things, all uh, spiritual things such as the heaven of heavens and the holy angels. When we come to verse 2, and grammatically what we have in verse 2, which is again why the gap does not work, is that grammatically we have a result phrase. Here we have the, the word vav, and, uh, immediately attached to the product that God created, the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless. And so it's a consequence, not a delay, grammatically. No other place in scripture would suggest otherwise. But notice what we have, because this is very important for understanding the rest of the chapter. The initial created mass had three design defects. What were they? Formless, formless void. Formless void dark. and dark. And so we understand what dark is. We need to understand what formless and void are. The words are used a number of times in Scripture. Formless means uninhabitable, and void means uninhabited. And so it was a place that was uninhabitable, it was a waste place, not fit for inhabitants, and there were no inhabitants at that point. That's very important to understand the rest of the chapter, that you understand exactly what the consequence is, that uh, the first word by God's design, so we can say there was imperfection, but it was a designed imperfection because it was the progressive way that God was going to work. But these three defects, or what are addressed then in the rest of the chapter. And so you must keep them in mind. And then we see the Holy Spirit protecting, hovering, and the word is used in Deuteronomy 32, 11 for an eagle, hovering over, brooding over her young. And the Spirit is protecting, particularizing, energizing. So the whole thing now is held together not by some providence. There can it be no gravity at this point, you see. You've got God, you've got this created mass of matter, and you've got heaven uh, as the dwelling place of God. But in terms now of our sphere, you've got this blob, dark, watery, uninhabitable, uninhabited mass, obviously being held together by the Spirit. 
and it's still the spirit that causes gravity to work. And, but not just holding together, protecting, and then at the command of the sun, the spirit is drawing out of this mass exactly that which the sun has commanded. And you see the parallel with redemption. As the word is the redeemer, it's the spirit who protects the elect until they're brought to faith and who individualizes in them makes the word of the Son active and effectual unto salvation and brings to perfection. I wish he did it much more quickly, but again, in God's province, he decided not to do it that way. But you see the beautiful parallels of how the Trinity acts in creation, and particularly the beautiful role of the Holy Spirit. Don't neglect the third person of the Godhead. Fred. Would you see matter, uh, mass, whatever, being created then and being disordered? Or yes. I see every, uh, I, the seed of everything is in this mass. Okay, because would you not have um, the, the forces that would act on matter, so you would have gravity and effect? But there's no outside forces to act on it. There's not a heavier force out here to act on the, on the matter. It's just a, a, a chaotic mass with nothing acting on it except the spirit. Because it's unformed. Okay. I think you need something like the sun, a heavy body, to cause one mass. My, my understanding is that's inherent in matter that, that the way gravity would act would be dependent on the mass of something, but that even if you have a smaller one, it's still acting, it's just insignificant or unobservable by us. So that, that I would just... That might be. I, I don't know. Well, you might be right. But I still think spirit had to hold it together. I mean, he has to now as well. So. But there were no other forces at work at this point but the spirit. Um, so this leads us then to the work of the six days. Now, what I want you to understand is that there is clearly a framework in Genesis chapter 1. And you would be foolish ever to react to the concept. In fact, it is the, it's the general framework, the framework hypothesis says. Because it's a framework, the chapter is structured to show us the orderly and progressive way that God deals with the three defects. So he first deals with darkness, and he makes that which is uh, uninhabitable, habitable. And then he makes the inhabitants in days four through six. And so it, it parallels, I mean, they're right to see that structure, that's exactly, but they fail to take it back to verse two. What God is doing in the six days of creation is in an orderly way, not some poetic way, in an orderly way, addressing that uh, which the Spirit describes for us as the consequence of the first created word. But there's even a greater structure in Genesis 1, and this will make it, I think, very useful and memorable for you and help you when we get into discourse analysis uh, to understand that, yeah, there's a, a discourse analysis going on here, and that is each of the six days has been put together by a very particular structure. I think there can be a lot of reasons uh, for that. One is we're talking about, until Moses wrote this, um, um, oral uh, revelation. Um, and even when he wrote it, there weren't copies of books, and so it's very memorable. And so what we have in Genesis chapter 1 are five things that make up the structure of each day. That's a there's diversity in them, but I think I'll be able to show you that they all fit the pattern of the five. The act of creation, the declaration of fulfillment, the statement of purpose, and the expression of delight, and the record of time. Each day is structured under these five rubrics. The act of creation it is seen in two expressions. Uh, God deliberately does it this way, so there's, for each day he has 
two ways that he's describing the act of creation. The first is the fiat. This is probably the most important thing. Um, and God said. And so you've got eight creative words. Four in days one through three, four in days four through six. And God said, let there be light, firmament, let dry land be gathered, let vegetation sprout, let luminaries be, let fish and fowl swarm, let the earth bring forth animals, let us make man in our image. So we call these the eight fiat acts of creation. Here's the role of, of our Savior. Um, Proverbs 8, 22 to 31 speaks of him being the worker alongside the Father. And in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, the Holy Spirit then explains this to us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him. Apart from Him, nothing came into being has come into being. So He is the creative Word. So when the Bible says that God said, in fact, I think it's a very good principle to keep in mind, anytime in the Bible God speaks, it's God the Son. That's why it's called the Word. So the angel of Jehovah, he is the, he is the revealer of Jehovah. He comes to people in human form. He speaks God's message. And so the first speaking work of God, the Son, was in these eight acts at creation. But the creative words are coupled. I mean, what's God wanting you to understand here? Each creative word has added to it a creative act. He spells it out. And uh, there are a number of words that the creative act is made, divided, generated, created. Those are the four words used to describe the amplification on God said. What did God do when God spoke? Larry? Dr. Piper, did, did God create darkness also? Yes. So all that was that he created the darkness, right. though not by a direct act or fiat. Well, I mean, it's not listed here. It's under Barah, which is clearly a direct act of God. Okay. And so, yes, but what we have in verse 2 was created by God. This uninhabitable, uh, chaotic mass and darkness. Uh, Isaiah 42.5, the prophet says that God created darkness, and he uses the word Barah uh, there as well. Thank you. What's that verse, Isaiah? 42.5. We'll come back to it. So, you've got that... Uh, uh, the things that are brought into existence directly are said to be made, uh, and that is uh, light, darkness, land, sea. Vegetation is said to be generated. The firmament is made, and the luminaries are made, and animal, uh, animals are made, man is made, but uh, the fish and man are also created. And so you've got these four different uh, actions that are all described in creative act. What's going on here? Eight fiat words, each one coupled with a further descriptive creative act. Well, I believe that the, God has shown us the uniqueness of origin. That each act is an immediate act of an all-powerful God. And what we have in that act is a non-duplicatable event. And that's what God tells us then in Genesis 2 verses 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their host. And by the seventh day God completed his work which he had done. And so we have eight non-repeatable acts of God. Now providence um, is so closely connected to God as creator that there's actually some uh, theologians have talked about uh, continual creation. But I think it's very important to distinguish that creation is this one-time act of God described here in a way that separates it from everything else that God does by the language. Yeah, there's, there's structured language here. It's quite clear, but it's saying something. That every one of these eight things were created by the Word of God in a specific fashion, immediately and instantaneously. How do you factor in the salvation of individuals uh, to that interpretation? Of 
Well, a spiritual work of creation is different. I mean, you got creation and redemption are two. So, uh, but in that case, the work of, cre uh, of regeneration is a transformative work, not an originating work. God takes something that is corrupt and dead and makes it alive. So, it would be a supernatural, providential act like raising the physical dead. So you get Ezekiel making that play. And by the way, I talked to uh, uh, Dr. Sarfati about this. I tend to be a bit more careful with my definition of miracle, particularly as we interact today with charismatics. I'm a supernaturalist. And I believe that God gives supernatural answers to prayer. I think he heals people. I think angels do some powerful things of which I read this morning, Psalm 91. We can be unaware of because of, 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 they've been sent to minister to the saints. A miracle is a supernatural act mediated through human agent. There are always signs. I think there are signs, wonders, and powers. And there's only three times in biblical history that miracles occurred. Uh, Moses, Joshua, Elijah, Elisha, Jesus, and the apostles. The rest of the acts in the Bible that you see that are supernatural, there's, there's not a human agent. There was no human agent involved in Daniel in the lion's den of Shadrach and Meshach not burning up. God can and at times does intervene supernaturally, but never through a human agent. So I've seen in answer to prayer, God heal people. Now most often he, if he heals, he heals either through the aspirin or the surgeon, but he will heal uh, when it suits his sovereign purposes. And so um, I don't like to call regeneration a miracle. It's a supernatural act of God, but it's his act exclusively. That's how I got off on that rabbit trail. A good trail. All right, then the second is that we have a declaration of fulfillment, which is also important. If you're going to analyze discourse, what's he trying to tell you? That right on these fiats and acts, it was completed. Uh, verse 3, and there was light. It was so. Firmament, dry land, uh, vegetation, luminaries, animals, all uh, it was so. Now the term is not used twice. It's not used on day five for fish and fowl. It's not used for man. But why is that? Because they are the objects of bara, And bara by itself says it was so. When God uses bara. He's the actor in bara. It is an immediate supernatural act. So here in the Declaration of Fulfillment, he teaches the completion and I like uh, Jonathan's word, I use the word maturity, functional maturity of creation. It was so. It's finished. There's no room for progress, a la Hugh Ross, or theistic evolution. No macro evolution. Each thing was completed according to its kind. It was so. And it was established. And then functional maturity. There's no deceit involved in this. The only way that a creation that came from God uh, to come into existence with this kind of language said, made, and it was so, it has to be functionally mature. It's not being said it's made with age to deceive. It's just the product of a fiat creation. God said, let there be a tree. There was a tree. There wasn't a seedling. God made man, a mature man, able to immediately have relations with a wife. Now, if you cut down that tree, it would have had rings. Well, the Bible didn't tell us that. But it's my belief that God made his initial acts of creation to have history and continuity with what he then would do providentially. So Adam didn't have baby teeth. Adam had grown up teeth. And uh, a tree easily could have had rings reflective of its maturity. Because that's how God was going to act in the rest. There's no deceit involved in that. You see. And so, but that's what the language is teaching us. As I say, the language keeps pushing us to immediate, instantaneous, mature creation. 
Well, we'll stop here, take a 10 minute break, and we'll finish out the other three um, parts of the structure, and then we'll get into how the rest of the Bible looks at Genesis chapter 1.